Fellow Eldritch Blast enjoyers, did you know that as a spellcaster you can get the widest critical hit ratio in the game, naturally getting critical hits on a spell attack roll of 13, and as low as a 12 while hiding? Hail adventurer, my name's Myotis, and I'm going to walk you through this great old one warlock class build. This character can be great for honor mode, and even has the potential to solo honor mode if you wanted to try it. This build is a little bit more specific than my regular videos. We're going to take a carefully crafted concoction of class levels, items, and feats. With the the right gear and abilities, almost every one of your Eldritch Blasts will be a critical hit. That also stacks reverberation and mental fatigue, and doing widespread frightened crowd control with the Goo Warlock's Mortal Reminder feature. You'll be able to hide in clouds of darkness to avoid damage, while picking enemies off one by one with Eldritch Blast, and freezing them in place with the Frightened Condition. Let's get into the breakdown. I like to think of the patron of the Great Old One Warlock being the Tadpole, or potentially the Elder Brain itself. That actually makes this build work for just about any of your companions. So long as you have a tadpole digging around in your brain, this can be the build for you. Naturally, that also makes it good for a tav, but I actually like to run this character as the Dark Urge. It works as a great way to rebuild your power after your amnesia, and I definitely encourage leaning into your illithid powers. We can pick just about any race. All the normal good ones would be fine, like a full or half wood elf. Asmodeus Tieflings and Drow also get a casting of darkness, which can be a core part of the build, so getting a free cast once per day is a really synergistic choice. Gith Yankee's Astral Knowledge and Misty Step are great on a main character, and especially on Warlocks, who want to have Misty Step but don't really want to use their spell slots to use it. Durgar Invisibility, Halfling Luck, all great abilities. It doesn't really matter what you choose. I'm going to stick with the default White Dragonborn for Dirge. Mechanically, Dragonborn is probably the worst overall race, but literally any one is viable. For subrace, I'll stick with White. For Frost Breath and Resistance to Cold Damage, and for class, we're not actually going to start with Warlock. If you're fine with respecking it withers a whole bunch of times, I'd probably encourage taking at least about your first six levels in Warlock and then respecking into a multi-class later. But for the purposes of the video, I'm going to assume that you're not going to respec at all. We're going to be taking levels in Fighter, Rogue, and Warlock. And something to keep in mind while leveling up a character is that when using items with spell save DCs, the class it uses to determine the difficulty check is the last new class you've taken. Not necessarily the last class you took a level in, but the last one that you've added overall to your character. Which means we want to be taking Warlock last, since of those three classes, it's the only one that uses Charisma as its modifier. And I've read apparently that for some reason Mortal Reminder works the same way, so it's really important that everything we do uses Charisma. So we're going to start with Fighter, mostly because this will give us proficiency in Constitution saving throws, which are used to maintain concentration on spells, and Warlocks will almost always be concentrating on a spell. And it also gives us proficiency in all weapons and armors for whatever equipment we want to equip. We'll start with the ability Second Wind for a small heal that'll help us through the early game. And for fighting styles, we're going to pick Defense. Once we pick up our first level in Warlock, we're going to be sticking to Eldritch Blast through the whole game, so we won't be using any of our weapons to make attacks. Although we will be dual wielding, so if you want to occasionally make an offhand attack, you could take two weapon fighting, especially if you're planning on wearing clothing instead of armor. As a Dark Urge, we start with the Haunted One background, giving us proficiency in medicine and intimidation. Any background is fine, just pick whatever fits your roleplay for your character. But if you're looking for something with the most mechanical benefit, I'd suggest taking one that has a lot of charisma-based skills like intimidation, persuasion, and deception. And then for our ability scores, we're going to clear out this. I'm going to move my plus two bonus down to charisma and leave the plus one bonus in constitution. There are two slightly different ways you could take your stats. I like a more balanced approach for the main character in a playthrough, so I take my dexterity to 14. This will give us a plus two bonus to our AC with certain armors, as well as giving us a plus two to initiative and dexterity saving throws, which are pretty common. Then we'll also take our constitution to 14. This will give us a half decent pool of hit points and help us save on constitution saving throws to maintain concentration over spells. I think this character is fine having an 8 intelligence. Then I'd take Wisdom up to 12. Wisdom is a really important saving throw. There are a ton of debilitating effects that target Wisdom, so I try to at least not have a negative modifier in it. But the plus one can actually go a long way. Then we can take Charisma up to 17. Normally, I don't plan builds around taking the Hag's Hair, but this character is only going to get two feats, and I think we have uses for them outside of ability score modifiers. So I really recommend starting with a 17 Charisma here and bumping it to an 18 with that item. With our high Charisma stat, it shouldn't be hard to get. Then we've got two points remaining. You could put them in Strength. It can be a little annoying not being able to get around the environment. Or if you really like skill checks, I'd take Intelligence up to a 10 so that you don't have a negative modifier in that. Now, alternatively to Min-Max a little, you could take those points out of Intelligence and some points out of Wisdom to bump Constitution up to a 16. 
or even dexterity if you prefer. But like I said, I like being a little bit more well-rounded as a main character, so I'm gonna keep my stats like this. Then I'm gonna pick a couple of skills. We got medicine and intimidation from our background. Sadly, fighter doesn't give us any other charisma options, but I'd probably take acrobatics so that you're not too easily pushed around. And then either perception or insight if you wanna have an easier time either in certain conversations or in discovering things in the world. On a solo run, I'd probably take Perception, but I prefer adventuring with the party, so I think I'll rely on another character to have a high Perception check and instead take Insight. Confirm this, and we can move on to level 2. Now, at level 2, I'm going to immediately start going into other classes. The next class we need levels in is Rogue. Now, at Rogue level 1, we get Sneak Attack, which we are basically never going to use since we'll be Eldritch Blasting away. But if you do decide to make an offhand attack, then you have it. But our skill choices here are important. Multi-classing into Rogue, we get to pick one additional skill, as well as our two expertise skills. So we're actually going to pick up Stealth here, because we eventually want to be able to hide every turn. So I'd put our first expertise in Stealth as well, and our second one in Intimidation, making that the main check we'll use in Dialogue. Now, I would plan on eventually getting the half Illithid power that gives you expertise in Intimidation, Persuasion, and Deception, in which case you could respec later to get rid of this Intimidation expertise from Rogue. Or if you plan on not getting it, I would maybe not actually take Stealth here and take Deception or persuasion but as long as you have one really good dialogue check that should be enough if that's selected we can move on to level three now we're going to take our first warlock level the nice thing about warlock is that we're going to be taking eldritch blast obviously and cantrip scale up with our character level instead of our class level so even though we're specced into three different classes now eldritch blast will still get its increased number of beams at level five and level ten so for our cantrips, we're going to take Eldritch Blast, and then I'd get rid of Blade Ward here and probably take Friends. Now you do have to be careful who you cast this on, because some characters will become hostile once they realize you've cast it on them, but it can be really helpful in certain dialogues, especially if you intend on fighting the creature anyway. Then for subclass, we're going to be taking the Great Old One. The Mortal Reminder feature makes it so that whenever we get a critical hit, creatures around the target have to make a Wisdom saving throw or become frightened until the end of their next turn. And this is what we're going to be building critical hit chance for. The Frightened Condition in Baldur's Gate is a little bit stronger than it is in 5th edition. It just gives them a flat disadvantage to attack rolls, and their movement drops to zero. This is going to work really great with the reverberation stacks we add on later, and we're even going to throw in some mental fatigue to make it even harder for creatures to make the saving throw. Then for our first level spells, I would probably take Hex and Armor of Agathus. Hex will give us a nice damage boost in the early game, as well as a debuff to certain ability checks, but it's worth noting that this does not affect saving throws. It's kind of common for people to think that this debuffs saving throws, but I can assure you that it does not. Then Armor of Agathus is just a really nice defensive spell to have. It scales really well with our Warlock spell slots, and has a great use of a leftover spell slot immediately before a short rest, although we'll probably replace it a little bit later. Now for level 4, and we're actually going to take a second level in a class. We want our second Warlock level as soon as we can get it. For your spell at this level, I would either take Tasha's Hideous Laughter as some pretty solid early game crowd control, but Arms of Hadar can also be useful. We're a ranged character, so we don't want any enemies close to us, but if you do find yourself surrounded, then Arms of Hadar can both do some good damage and it prevents targets from taking reactions. So it can also help you get out of a bad situation. This is more of a niche pick, and I think thematically I like Tasha's Hideous Laughter a little bit better as a way to mess with other people's minds. Then we get to pick our first two Eldritch Invocations. Of course, we're going to take Agonizing Blast and Repelling Blast. These are the core features of any Warlock, adding our Charisma modifier to the damage that we do, and the ability to push the targets we hit with Eldritch Blast. Then, like any learned spellcaster, you can replace a spell, but at this early stage, we're not going to do that. Now, this is where I kind of want to start focusing on building our critical hit chance, as well as making sure our feats don't come too late in our build. At some point, we're going to be taking Spell Sniper, but I'd like to do that with our second feat, and we have to take it as a Warlock, because the cantrip will scale based on the spellcasting modifier of the class that takes the feat. So in order for it to scale with Charisma, we have to take it as a Warlock. So for now, I'm going to switch back to Fighter, and we're going to take this to level 4 Fighter for that feat. And at level 2, we get Action Surge, which is great on literally every character in the game. Nobody's upset with that one. Now at level 6, we get to pick our Fighter subclass, and I'm going to take Champion. This improves our critical hit chance by 1, and it applies to all attack rolls, including our spells. So at this point, we'll be critical hitting with Eldritch Blast on a roll of a 19, and if you also grab the Knife of the Undermountain King in Act 1, you'll be able to crit on an 18. Now at level 7, we'll take our last Fighter level. This lets us take a feat, and there are a few different options here. You could take Ability Score Improvement to max out that Charisma, 
With Ethel's hair, you can get to a 20 here. Alternatively, you could not worry about Ethel's hair and take an actor. This will give us expertise in deception and performance. This is a great alternative if you're not taking the half illithid skill, but we only have a plus two dexterity and we don't have the space in our equipment to take any initiative boosting gear, so I would actually take alert. Winning initiative is really important, especially on this character, where we want to get our setup going as soon as possible. That's often going to involve casting darkness and hiding, and this character is a little bit squishy, although we can be wearing heavy armor, so you do not want to get surprised. I think this is our best overall option. Now at level 8 we're going to go back into Warlock. I think there's a few key features here we want to pick up before we go back into rogue levels as well. So at level 3 we have second level spells now, and here I think it's important for basically every character to have Misty Step that can take it. You want to avoid having to use a Warlock spell slot on Misty Step, but it's an important tool to have access to when you need it. Then we also get our Pact Boon, and here I want to take Pact of the Tome. We will be wielding weapons for the critical hit chance reduction, but we won't actually be making attacks with them, so we don't need to take Pact of the Blade. You can get Shovel as a familiar, so you also don't need Pact of the Chain. I think that picking up Guidance from Pact of the Tome is hugely important. It's even nice to have on more than one character on your party. It's pretty unlikely we ever cast Vicious Mockery, but Thorn Whip can actually be nice to have to potentially pull enemies into hazardous effects. And if you have a character within five feet of you giving you disadvantage on your Eldritch Blasts, Thorn Whip is considered a melee attack, so won't be made with disadvantage. Finally, we can replace a spell, which I always recommend as a warlock whenever you get new spell slot levels. Here I'm going to replace Tash's Hideous Laughter with Hold Person. I think it's just an upgrade as far as crowd control goes. And since we won't have lower level spell slots to cast Tasha's Hideous Laughter, Old Person is just a much better option. And we'll move on to our next level. At level nine, we're a fourth level Warlock. Normally I would recommend picking up Bone Chill here, because having a way to stop certain enemies from healing is really important to have, but we can actually pick this cantrip up with Spell Sniper. So instead, I'd probably take Blade Ward. It's not hugely important, but it can be nice to have as a pre-fight buff. Then we get another second level spell. There are a bunch of great options here. Personally, I like Cloud of Daggers, Darkness, and Detect Thoughts, all for different reasons. We will be picking up Devil Sight at our next level, so I'd probably take Darkness. It's definitely something you want to have access to. Then we also get our second feat, and this time we're going to take Spell Sniper. This will reduce our critical hit chance with spells by one, and it's the reason that martial characters can't get their critical hit chance quite this low. It's the only reduction that's specifically for spellcasters. Then for a cantrip, as I said, I'd take Bone Chill. If you either don't want or already have Bone Chill, you'd probably take Shock and Grasp, so that you have a good option while enemies are within melee range of you, but I think the utility of Bone Chill is more important, especially since we already have Thorn Whip. Then at level 10, we have one more Warlock level to take. We get third level spells here, and we definitely are going to take counter spell. Nullifying enemy spells is just way too important. And for our Eldritch Invocation, we're going to take Devil's Sight. Now we can see through Magical Darkness, and the full build is almost online. A big part of our game plan will be casting the Darkness spell and hiding within it. It's preferable if other characters could cast it instead of the Warlock themselves, but you can also be self-sufficient. Then again, I'd always replace a spell when we get new spell levels. At this point, I'd probably get rid of Armor of Agathis. But you could also get rid of Hex if you're not using it anymore, since we're usually going to be concentrating on other things. In fact, I've even talked myself into it a little bit. And we're going to take Hunger of Hadar. This is one of the best crowd control spells in the game, and is unique to Warlocks. There's just no good reason not to take it. Then we can move to level 11. Here we're going to go back to Rogue levels. It's important that we get Cunning Action Hide. This is what's going to let us cast Eldritch Blast and then hide in our darkness at the end of each turn. And the reason that this is important is that one of our sources of critical hits, the Shade Slayer Cloak, only works if you're hiding or invisible. The dash disengage can also be pretty useful. Then our final level 12. I think here we're going to stick with Rogue, and unlike most builds that take the Thief subclass, we're actually going to take the Assassin subclass. This makes it so that we have advantage on attack rolls against creatures that haven't taken a turn yet, and with the alert feat, that should be most creatures on the first round. We also gain Ambush, which makes it so that whenever we attack a surprised creature, it's automatically a critical hit, which is obviously great with Mortal Reminder, although I have found it kind of inconsistent with Eldritch Blast. I don't know if it doesn't apply to spells well, or if I just have been noticing it incorrectly. And since we're going to be trying to start most encounters with a surprise round, we also have Assassin's Alacrity, which immediately restores our action and bonus action. Now just with our class levels, we're able to set up encounters with Darkness or Hunger of Hadar, and get a one-sided advantage with Devil's Sight. We'll be able to Eldritch Blast and then Cunning Action hide every round, and with the champion subclass and spell sniper, we're critical hitting on an 18. So let's move over equipment to get those last six points of critical hit reduction, as well as the other items that feed into the build. Now this build has some very specific item needs, so there won't be as diverse a selection as I normally do for these videos. We will be using elixirs of viciousness for one of our critical hit reductions, and you can have arrows of darkness on hand for ways to create small darkness clouds without having to use a spell slot. Our most important item to pick up in Act 1 is the Knife of the Undermountain King. 
It's one of the first item-based ways to reduce our critical hit chance, but until you pick this up, you can use the Spell Sparkler. You can get this very, very early in Act 1, and Lightning Charges add a little bit of hit chance and damage to our Eldritch Blasts. Then I'd recommend the Daredevil Gloves pretty much up until we get better gloves in Act 3. These give another plus one to our spell attack rolls with Eldritch Blast, but it also makes it so that when there's creatures within five feet of us, we won't have disadvantage on our ranged spell attacks. The other really important item to pick up in Act 1 are the Boots of Stormy Clamor. This inflicts a creature with two stacks of reverberation whenever we inflict a condition upon them, and as far as I can tell, the Displace condition from Repelling Blast counts for this. And it seems to count even when you miss most of the time, and it's important to note that eventually Eldritch Blast will be three separate beams, each applying these stacks on their own. So you can easily spread reverberation around different creatures, or stack it up extremely quickly on one. You only need five stacks of reverberation to have a chance to knock a creature prone, so three blasts from Eldritch Blast does this all on its own, and if even one of those blasts hits and they fail the saving throw against Mortal Reminder, they'll be prone and frightened, unable to move or get up. Now in Act 2, we'll grab a few other important items. We can get another stack of critical hit reduction from either the Covert Cowl or the Dark Justicier Helmet. Both of these require us to be obscured to get the critical hit chance reduction, but wouldn't you know it, we're obscured in a cloud of darkness. So this is actually really easy to keep up at all times. We also get the Spine Shutter Amulet in Act 2, and whenever you deal damage with a ranged spell attack, it inflicts an additional two stacks of reverberation. So that's four stacks per blast that hits. We also get our two rings here, the first being the Risky Ring, giving us advantage on all attack rolls, while receiving disadvantage on saving throws. But one of the best ways to improve our critical hit chance is to give ourselves advantage on attacks. There are ways to do this without the Risky Ring, like through Clouds of Darkness, and different abilities from allies, but just having a solid way to always have advantage no matter the situation gives a huge increase to our likelihood of rolling above an 11. Then the Ring of Mental Inhibition makes it so that whenever a foe fails a saving throw against one of our spells or actions, they gain a two turns of mental fatigue. Between our reverberation stacks, mortal reminder, and other spells like Hunger of Hadar, we'll be causing enemies to roll saving throws pretty often, and giving them mental fatigue when they fail creates this compounding, debilitating effect. Basically, once we lock down an enemy, they will stay locked down. Now, in a lot of characters in Act 2, you could also get the potent robes, which are probably our best in slot armor piece. Since this is clothing, we'll take a pretty big hit to our AC, but we're also going to be hiding every round, so that doesn't really matter. Sadly, on a dark urge, this is much harder to get. I don't have it on my Dark Urge Honor Mode playthrough, so I just recommend any armor that gives you the highest AC, ideally without disadvantage on stealth checks. You'll notice that I'm wearing the Cerebral Citadel armor from Act 3. I just think it's thematic with the whole frightening build, and since I'm leaning into Illithith powers, it just fits the look. Now this does give disadvantage on stealth checks. I'd probably be better to use something like the Helldisk armor that doesn't impose disadvantage on stealth checks. It's probably just a better armor overall, honestly, but it's hard for me to resist that Illithid drip. The Cloth of Authority is also a really nice thematic alternative. Although again, we'll have a slightly lower AC. Act 3 is also where we'll find the rest of our critical hit chance gear. We can upgrade our helmet to Sapphire Rock's Horned Helmet. It'll just reduce our critical hit chance by one without any conditions. And we also can't be frightened, which is, again, just nicely thematic with our whole frightened thing. Then there's the Shade Slayer Cloak, which is why we took rogue levels. While hiding, the number we need to roll a critical hit is reduced by one. And it's a lot safer to start your turns with an Eldritch Blaster spell and then hide at the end of your turn. You can hide at the beginning to still get the effect, but then you won't be hidden for the rest of the initiative order. And this character is not particularly tanky, so you want to keep the focus off of you. Since patch six, creatures can still shoot shoot things into darkness, you need to have all the other creatures in the darkness with you to avoid that. We also get the dead shot bow. We won't be using it to attack, of course, but it again reduces our critical hit chance by one. And then we get bloodthirst. Uh, mine is named a little bit different because Orin's body disappeared in my playthrough, so I had to use console commands to bring it into the game. Ideally, you won't have to do that. But like the others, this reduces our critical hit chance by one. And I actually like to have this in the offhand for this character. We don't care about the vulnerability to piercing damage. So I like the plus one to AC, and you can sometimes use your reaction to make a melee attack. You won't be doing crazy damage with your melee attacks, but it's just another chance to get a critical hit and apply Mortal Reminder. You just have to balance the fact that if you make that attack, you'll lose your hidden condition. At the start of Act 3, I like to upgrade my gloves to the Cerebral Citadel gloves. Whenever we frighten a creature, which will be often, you gain 1d4 to attack rolls and saving throws. It's just a solid boost. But really what we care about is added damage, especially since we don't have the potent robes for that. So eventually you'll upgrade either to the Crater Flesh gloves or the Spell Might gloves. We'll be getting a lot of critical hits, so the 1d6 force damage from the Crater Flesh gloves will be applied pretty consistently, which always becomes 2d6 on a crit. The Spell Might gloves give us a minus 5 to attack rolls, but a d8 of extra damage instead of a d6, and it's also force damage because Eldritch Blast is force damage, and it will also apply to all attacks instead of just
Chris Critz. So the spell my gloves are probably a little bit better, but they're also kind of a pain in the ass to get. I've gone with the Crater Flesh gloves just because they're on that critical hit theme. But between being a champion fighter, having the spell sniper feet, using an elixir of viciousness, wearing Savarok's helm, Deadshot, Knife of the Undermountain King, Bloodthirst, and using Cunning Action Hide every turn to make use of the Shade Slayer cloak, that's an 8 point reduction on our critical hit chance so that we critically hit on a 12. And once you add in the advantage of the Risky Ring, that's almost every attack. At least one of the three blasts from Eldritch Blast will crit. This character is capable of dealing massive amounts of critical hit damage every turn with Eldritch Blast without consuming any resources, as well as locking down entire groups of enemies with Mortal Reminder Frighten and stacks of reverberation. And they're one of the best party faces in the game with expertise on one of their charisma checks, as well as the friends cantrip. Not to mention that they're hard to pin down thanks to Cunning Action Hide. They have other forms of great crowd control like Whole Person and Hunger of Hadar. And you even have access to casting Haste once per day. Now this is a pretty tight build. There's not a lot of room to play with the class levels, but I'm not 100% sure that the rogue levels are fully necessary. They do give us one of our critical hit threshold reductions with Shade Slayer Cloak, but the difference between 12 and 13 is not huge. You could potentially add Bard levels into this class instead. Cutting Warrants is an excellent ability. You would still get expertise that way, as well as some other spell slot levels. And the other really strong combination would be going down to only two or three Warlock levels and taking a bunch of Sorcerer levels so you can quicken Eldritch Blasts. You could even make an argument for losing the critical hit reduction from Champion Fighter in favor of just doing a Sorcerer Warlock split. It wouldn't be difficult to still get a critical hit on a 14, and then be able to dish out way more Eldritch Blasts every turn. But I do think going for the full 12 point reduction is really fun. And I think this is the class setup that can make the best use of it. In terms of additional team options, since we're kind of building around darkness here, having other characters that also work with darkness is really good. Especially a Beastmaster Ranger with the Dire Raven. This is probably the best in-game way to spread darkness around the battlefield. And you can even find a build guide for it from last week's video. Otherwise, you want other frontliners. Since we're a little bit squishy, you want something like a fighter or a barbarian that are able to take the hits for your warlock. And the one role that this character can't fill at all is support. So having a druid, paladin, cleric, or a bard of some kind to offset that weakness would make a really solid overall party. In my honor mode run, I have this warlock, Astarian as a beastmaster ranger, Lazelle as a tiger barbarian, with two warlock levels for devil's sight, and Shadowheart as a trickery cleric. So I hope you like this critical hitting warlock. Mortal Reminder is one of my favorite features that Larian added, and overall the game makes warlocks feel really good to play. I'm putting out new build guides every week right now, so make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you know when they go live. I've got more ideas than I have time for. So until the next time, happy adventuring.